Okay. Well, let's uh, let's get started here. Thank you, everybody, um, for joining us here for a webinar on achieving closed loop additive manufacturing quality control with real time monitoring and analytics. Um, today, uh, we will be discussing uh, our current challenges in real time AM quality control, uh, the benefits of closed loop processing. Um, some descriptive details of kind of the integral components of the Sigma Labs and Materialize uh, system architecture. Um, go through the, the testing and demonstration of this connected solution uh, and the results uh, that came from it. And then we will talk about uh, what is in store for the future and uh, what's next uh, in the state of closed loop control. Um, I am joined here uh, today uh, by two individuals. Um, my name is Jake Brunsberg. I'm the president and COO of Sigma Labs. I'll be moderating uh, the panel uh, today. I'm joined by Sven Cornelison, uh, Senior Research Engineer at Materialize, and Darren Beckett, the CTO of Sigma Labs. Uh, throughout the presentation today, just for some housekeeping, um, there is a Q&A box. We would highly encourage uh, anybody submitting questions throughout the session. At the end, I will go through and we can ask the panel <clears throat> the questions that you submitted um, and feel free to submit away. If for some reason uh, we run out of time, we certainly can uh, provide some answers via follow-up uh, from the webinar as well to any uh, Q&A that, that's not gotten to. So appreciate uh, you doing that through the presentation and we'll uh, make that nice and interactive as we get through uh, the end of the presentation. So I wanted to start, uh, you know, from the the standpoint of just uh, what's the current state of the additive industry and why is uh, what we're here today uh, important? And then I'm going to kick it over to get into the technical details quickly. But I thought it was very interesting and timely. Uh, the World Economic Forum just put out its guidance uh, for technologies over the next ten years and highlighted 3D printing. Um, as one of those really key core important technologies uh, over the next decade. Um, with that, there was some work done with Fraunhofer and some surveys on, uh, you know, what are the key kind of items that need to go uh, with the 3D printing industry today to really accelerate it to where it needs to be. Um, in that survey, 95% of respondents uh, rated additive manufacturing quality and qualification as highly or very highly important to the successful growth. Uh, the only one really trumping that being cost reduction, uh, which I think those two things uh, go very hand in hand. Um, and, and one of the key excerpts that, you know, we'll be highlighting today that really kind of spurred, I think, a lot of good discussion. I wish maybe this, uh, this webinar had come out a few months prior because maybe this ex excerpt would have changed a little bit. But enhancement of quality insurance method, uh, methods such as in-process monitoring are a priority in current research. Overall, Rather slow and continuous progress is expected in the development of simplified quality assurance and qualification. Uh, hopefully today uh, we're gonna we're gonna make that statement feel like things are moving a little bit faster. Uh, certainly work to come, but we're excited to be uh, a part and have a partner like Materialize tackling this problem uh, that's really important to the additive industry as a whole. So uh, why are uh, maybe just a little background? Why why was quality challenges really at the forefront of that? And I think um, additive manufacturing uniquely presents itself as uh, a foundry in a box, uh, largely. So we're consolidating part design, uh, the actual making of the materials and the alloying all into one unit. So you get uh, unlimited design changes from where we're at today, a lot less limitations. So you get complexity there. You have uh, differences in powder metallurgy vendors and, and alloys. You have over 50 3D metal printer OEMs that provide uh, somewhat different technologies. And then uh, a various amounts of secondary post operations and uh, QC techniques. So with all these variables connecting uh, in standards and really making this uh, something like a traditional manufacturing technology is of top priority to really create a standard workflow that unites the entire uh, industry and standardizes uh, the process. And that is really at the heart of the mission statement as to why Sigma Labs is here. Um, uh, we're here to accelerate the adoption of additive manufacturing by setting 
standards for in-situ quality monitoring and analytics. Uh, really focusing on being a third-party agnostic uh, provider to the marketplace, focusing on standard-based implementations and being an active member of those communities, uh, really looking for out-of-the-box functionality for part qualification, and then integrating into the broader ecosystem uh, that exists, uh, providing open source connection points and really enabling standard data flow. Um, and then the last one, which I think brings us to the topic of exactly why we're here today, uh, we focus on doing this through radical collaboration. And we live and breathe that every day. And we could not be more excited to have a great partner like Materialize here uh, today to talk about uh, closed loop uh, manufacturing here in Additive. So here are the three things um, that drive uh, what we're doing uh, today in this collaboration, why uh, in-process monitoring uh, matters and where closed loop fits in. So we talked about that World Economic Forum uh, present or uh, study, and the two top things were quality control and cost. And at the heart of what quality control can deliver is cost reduction. And that's done largely in three uh, manners. Uh, it's reduction in the MPI or development cycle. So shortening times to part qualification and iteration on part design. Um, it's lowering manufacturing operational costs by improving OEE and giving yourself a way to really live monitor and analyze what's going on in the build and get to a go, no-go or an educated QC step. And then uh, the last item is removing the need for uh, costly inspection on every component that comes off the line. So either providing guidance as to exactly where you should uh, do quality assurance or uh, removing the need to, to do it as often as, as you're doing today. So where does Sigma Labs live in the value chain and how do we connect to this? Um, we focus on three things at Sigma Labs. Uh, machine, uh, is my machine operating the way uh, I expect it to? Process, is my broader process set and operating the way I need to? And have I made a good part? Uh, is my part that came out of that machine and process uh, good? So we live in this monitoring area central to the in-process. The beauty of this is it feeds things outside of this. As we collect that data, it can feed back into the front end uh, pieces all the way to simulation, uh, temperature profiles, what happens, what grain structures am I creating? And it can live all the way in the end in quality reports, material properties, and qualified parts. Uh, but the, the most interesting piece that we're here to talk about today is how do I actually make my process more robust by closing that loop and, and circling back through it. And that's where I'll turn to focus on a specific item. Today, we're going to talk about energy density uh, and its impact on closed loop manufacturing. So I will turn it over to Darren and we'll get right into the meat uh, and potatoes of this. So Darren, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Jacob. So. Um... To build a quality continuum uh, and to build it out, we, we had Sigma Labs about four years ago, uh, started with um, essentially the, the melt pool monitoring component of it. And we've also expanded out into uh, camera too. But today, this particular collaboration really has focused on some of the beginnings of where we started, which is particularly energy density. Um, what we're doing here on the right-hand side is you've got a, a TIE 6-4 uh, spectra. It's a collected coaxially on, on a, an additive manufacturing system. And within that, we're collecting the, uh, we integrate and collect the, um, uh, the addition of, of the energy density. Energy density itself is, uh, we look at between the 400 and 800 nanometer bands and then more of the visible range. And um, it is the, essentially uh, the, the beginning um, um, the beginning for closed loop work that we're uh, working on here. We do have a, a temperature metric also, uh, it's called TEP, uh, that we're not using so much in this particular uh, effort, but which we will continue to in the future. Um, it particularly looks at the, um, the ratio of two bands to remove um, um, in, in acidity. Let's go to the next slide, please. If we look at the particular implementation, um, schematically, uh, we can see that it, it is collecting coaxially, and you can see the arrangement here of the uh, TED sensor relative to, uh, to the melt pool. Um, uh, this particular construct is showing enough data lens uh, just for schematic, but um, it, it can work with uh, many uh, coaxial systems, um, with different uh, various scans in different positions. Um, all has the, also has the ability to scale up to, to um, 
dual and quad laser and beyond, uh, given this particular implementation. The technology itself is, is based on uh, photodiodes, um, and more recently, avalanche-based photodiodes, and is collecting information at 200 kilohertz. Why 200 kilohertz? Primarily because we want to comprehend all of the variation um, in the melt pool, uh, which is, as you well know, is a, um, a very erratic, um, dynamic, non-equilibrium process uh, that composes uh, the pool, which is uh, composed of um, electrons, neutrons, and uh, partially ionized species, including um, uh, the melt pool itself that is performing irradiance. So this particular approach is to, is to look uh, um, coaxially um, at the at the melt pool itself and try to capture most of the irradiance. What I'm showing here on the right hand side is really just the um, the fact that we we can be multi material. So as new materials are developed, new alloys come online. This particular technology will expand with new materials and and, and also with um, um, with a laser scalability. One last thing to, 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 to note here is this particular implementation can also be calibrated uh, to a NIST uh, black body uh, calibrated source. And we recently as a company uh, accomplished um, uh, that particular in, in the last year. Um, but for today, we're really gonna focus on uh, the TED sensor, which is um, our first beginning uh, four years ago, uh, which uh, we begun our, the, the you know, beginning of this collaboration uh, with Materialize. Uh, to really get going on uh, demonstrating, um, you know, the, the, the beginnings of closed loop control and that application. Next slide, please. Just to show you then the, um, uh, you know, the, the power of what we can do today and what's what's possible. Um, here we have a, an example of a, if you will, a stochastic, stochastically generated um, um, error and uh, on a build process, and you can see a layer-wise image that is showing a lack of powder on this particular part. And we can see the corresponding energy density signature as well as the temperature. And on the right-hand side, we can see the lack of fusion defects that are showing up. This gives us great, um, you know, great, uh, it becomes a great candidate, if you will, for uh, data fusion uh, and deep machine learning to train a model on for particularly lack of fusion. Next slide, please. Just to finish then, so at, at the beginnings, you can see how the, the closed loop path to the future builds out and uh, in collaboration with Materialize and Sven uh, are a really a good partner here. Uh, we've been working to, uh, to, you know, to begin uh, this first level uh, of online control, really looking at uh, laser power in conjunction with a, an, in, um, an in-process metric such as a TED. Uh, so uh, with that, I would like to uh, hand it over to Sven now, and he will uh, continue uh, to show you and uh, talk with you about uh, what we've accomplished in the last few years. All right. Thank you, Dara, and thank you, Jake, for that very nice introduction. I hope everyone can hear me if not someone will complain, I guess. Um, so very briefly, an introduction about Materialize. So uh, Materialize is originally a Belgian company, but we are present globally nowadays, and we've been around since 1990. So that's uh, 30 years of innovating, if you want, for a better and healthier world. Uh, and we really mean that Materialize really means that. Uh, we focus on um, making uh, meaningful applications for additive manufacturing. Um, we have three main business units at Materialize, our software unit, uh, manuf in-house manufacturing unit and also materialized medical, which in a way you could see as one of those uh, meaningful applications if you want. Uh, the basics uh, of much of this innovative nature at Materialize comes from a very close collaboration between all of our you know, business units, uh, which works particularly well at Materialize. Uh, and we like to take this uh, collaborative spirit out also outside of Materialize. Uh, and then we call it co-creation. Co and of course, uh, one prime example of a very nice co-creation project is the project that we will describe here uh, today uh, between uh, Sigma Labs and Materialize. Now, uh, the, again, uh, the topic of today is, is really centered around the Materialize software unit. Uh, if you want, and the software unit really focuses on helping our customers 
uh, transfer uh, to a truly digital manufacturing uh, process uh, and, and hopefully help our customers uh, revolutionize uh, their industry. Uh, for the future, sorry, that's gone too far. For the future, um, we hope that we can make uh, additive manufacturing even more the go-to choice for manufacturing. Uh, and we hope that we uh, can really strengthen more uh, the additive manufacturing tool chain as materialized with our software solutions uh, and hope that we can really make the potential of sustainable additive manufacturing uh, come true. Now, um, talking about manufacturing, uh, there was this very nice introductory slide by Jacob uh, where he described the, the phases uh, of a manufacturing uh, process or of starting up a manufacturing process if you want uh, in the sense of you know you have a new product introduction uh, which we have materialized typically called the planning phase you have um, uh, your execution right execution of your manufacturing which we call the, the do phase if you want and then you have your your post-process inspection which we call the check phase uh, and as materialize, we have already uh, tools and knowledge to help our customers in, in all of those uh, three phases. Um, so in the plan phase, the most known uh, software that we have is probably Magix, uh, which is a, is a build preparation software, which is used by um, a large portion of the AM market. Uh, today, though, we will be talking more about the do and the check phase, where we also already today have a lot of software solutions. Uh, and the MCP, the Materialized Control Platform, will be one uh, that we will be focusing on uh, today, where we use the MCP not only for driving um, the um, for driving the control, for driving the uh, machine but also for doing the monitoring in uh, collaboration with uh, Sigma Labs. Now, uh, this is a large uh, software ecosystem, of course. If we narrow it down, uh, sorry, one more thing. Um, we are currently uh, working very hard to add also a learn step. Uh, and this ties in a little bit to the last slide of Darren. Uh, where he mentioned that we have uh, multiple forms uh, of, of closing the loop, uh, of, of taking control of the, of the monitoring uh, data, uh, and what we call the data lake, uh, so uh, the cloud solution that gathers the data from all of the process steps, uh, from all of the software that is used in your, in your additive manufacturing chain. Um, we gather that in the data lake yeah, and we are currently working very hard on allowing you to uh, to learn uh, the maximum from uh, all the data that's gathered throughout your uh, production now uh, for today um, we're of course only using a subset uh, of the software solutions so um, let's call this the ecosystem for for actually printing a part yeah, for actually uh, successfully finishing an AM build, where you start from a CAD file, you might do some design optimization, you use magics to prep your build, and then, you know, what we will be talking about today, uh, you hopefully use the MCP, the Materialized Control Platform, to control your machine. Um, so that's a bit of an introduction uh, to Materialize and to what I will be talking about. Uh, the outline for the rest of my talk, so I will uh, give a bit more details about what the Materialized Control Platform is. Um, we have integrated that, as uh, Darren and Jacob already mentioned, with the print write 3D solution. Um, so I will talk about that. I will then uh, introduce how we see closed loop control with this combined uh, solution the metric a bit more details about the metric that we use how we then actually implemented control and then i will talk about the experiment and the results which is of course hopefully the most interesting part of this presentation so our mcp our materialized control platform is a, an open machine control solution 
that, in our opinion, provides a full answer to laser-based additive manufacturing. What we mean by that is that our MCP provides the possibility to do both process control and monitoring and control in the same system. And this gives you uh, unparalleled possibilities. Let me give you a bit more detail about that. So we really see the MCP as a process controller. It's a combined software and hardware solution that is embedded in a machine by the machine builder or by a research institute. Uh, and we've actually made the system so that the MCP, our process controller, controls those parts of the process where we as materialize with our software ecosystem can make uh, the largest impact, can make the biggest difference. And this is uh, in everything that relates to scanning and lasing, because that's where we usually use our software ecosystem uh, for. So if you have this implementation of the MCP, uh, you embed the process controller, which drives the laser and scanners in your machine, and you can run uh, the software part of it on the industrial PC that's already in your, uh, in your AM uh, machine. Uh, and so inside our MCP is an, is an open scan card solution, um, which, like I said, drives the scanning and lasers, but, and that's of course very important for today, it also allows you to do data capturing and real-time control, uh, which I will come back uh, in a bit more detail in the later slides. So the um, integration with the print write 3D system uh, was as follows. So uh, we have a long-standing collaboration with the people from Sigma Labs, uh, and originally we had the, the full-blown Sigma Lux solution, if you want, so the standalone machine agnostic melt pool monitoring system uh, that you can still get from, uh, from Sigma Lux, of course, today, uh, and where um, you need quite a lot of hardware to get all the signals from the machine that you need. Huh? So, um, of course, the interesting data is the, the coaxial diodes huh, that uh, Aaron showed you uh, how it works. Um, that's actually what gives you the, the multiple monitoring data and the interesting metrics that Sigma Labs provides. But as a standalone system, uh, in order to make sense of that diode data, they also need to grab some additional information like the scanner XY position so that they can plot this data in space. Uh, and the laser gate and the laser power are handy to have and to make sense of this data. So in order to grab that data, uh, there is an interface board, you need a data acquisition system. This data acquisition system streams the data to an industrial PC and then to the visualization server where the real magic of Sigma Labs happens. And uh, don't get me wrong, I mean, that's a, that's a perfectly fine system right and um, it works and you know you can look at the data and make your conclusions uh, but of course uh, you know giving the uh, possibilities of uh, our MCP um, it's a bit uh, double right so uh, knowing the fact uh, like I explained that our MCP can also do the data acquisition acquisition sorry uh, it makes more sense uh, to implement the system, as you can see on the, on the bottom schematic, where the diodes, uh, again, that give you the information that you really want, are directly hooked up to the MCP. The MCP, of course, have as the other data that you would need to make sense of this signal readily available because it's driving the process. And so in the simplified version, very schematic, of course, the diodes are attached to the MCP. Uh, we use the, the data capturing and logging capabilities of the MCP to send one file per laser uh, per layer, excuse me, to the Sigma Labs visualization server, and the visualization server can do exactly the same as before. So there are a few straightforward uh, advantages of this, I would say. The, the first one, and maybe also the most important one, is that you greatly reduce the hardware footprint of the monitoring system, which, you know, it reduces your complexity and it also reduces your cost, 
right? Uh, which is always an advantage. Um, you get an open integrated combined system uh, with our MCP inside. That's the second advantage. And the third advantage is that the, the signals and in particular the, um, the XY position signals that we get from the MCP are quite a bit cleaner and nicer than the signals that you would have when you would have to grab that data from an existing machine. Um, so this is definitely an, an additional advantage. Um, very briefly, just to uh, introduce you to how we see closed loop control, and this might look very silly, but bear with me for two minutes and then we get to the real nice stuff. So um, typically, most machines out there nowadays still are run in what you could call an open loop AM process, where you have your input, which hopefully is, you know, a file coming from one of our build processors where you define exactly how your vector should be scanned, uh, with which laser power, with which speed. Um, and somewhere in there, in that input, there's also machine settings, you know, uh, minimal oxygen values, recoding speeds, pressure in the chamber, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, all of that goes into your process, and you get out a part of a certain quality. Uh, and so, uh, two things. Huh? So, first of all, like uh, Jacob already nicely introduced, to set up this process in a qualitative way is not so straightforward. We've noticed both internally and with our customers. Uh, moreover, uh, because of variations in the process, because sometimes variations in the machine, despite OEM's best efforts of making you know, the process as reproducible as possible, sometimes the, the quality of the output varies, even though the input stays the same. And so one solution, and again, uh, Jacob and Darren have talked about it already, is to have monitoring there to help you um, you know, decide and determine whether your process is running uh, as it should. Uh, and of course, we are all for that. Uh, but as Jacob showed in this slide, um, with the phases of, uh, of manufacturing, if you want, uh, monitoring can give you a lot of benefits. The only disadvantage, of course, is that monitoring by itself, uh, it can tell you whether your output is of high quality or not but it's not gonna increase the quality of your output. And that's of course where uh, closed loop control comes in because, and that's of course an, an important because if you have a good quality metric uh, while you are monitoring your process, uh, if you know what is the expected value of that metric, uh, you can actually create a control loop which uh, can keep that process more stable. And so instead of you know, telling you that your uh, quality is going out of spec, you can actually control your machine back to in specifications uh, settings, of course. So that's the idea. That's all very high level. Uh, what I mainly wanted to say with that is the metric is uh, of a very high importance for your closed control loop. Um, and so not only the quality of the data, but also that you understand well enough uh, what that metric is and also what it isn't. And so um, the TED metric uh, from Sigma Lux, it correlates very nicely with input energy density. Uh, the example shown here on the slide is actually a, a process development uh, experiment that we did internally uh, at Materialize, where we actually uh, built a, a number of samples, I think 36, uh, with different input settings. Yeah? So different input energy densities, and we're looking actually for that energy density that gives us uh, a nice density and nice mechanical properties. Um, and what you can see if you plot, and that's very important, the thermal energy density versus your input energy density, you can see that you have a very nice uh, linear correlation. So you can use the metric TED to know 
which uh, energy density you're putting in. And later, uh, when we talk about closed loop control, you can also use it for controlling towards the right value of energy density as a consequence of this. Um, and as you probably know, um, of course, energy density is not the only metric for making high quality samples, but it's definitely true that if your energy density goes outside of your ideal processing window, then it will have a huge influence on the density of your sample. So in a way, this thermal energy density is a good, good indicator also for the density of your parts. Now, um, I talked about the NCP already uh, and that it had a, a scan card solution in there that's quite particular. Um, and so this is the next generation scan card that uh, the NCP team at Materialize has been developing. Um, so it does the basics uh, like we used to, like I explained before. So it drives the scanning uh, and the lasing uh, because that's what you need to do. And that's where we believe as Materialize uh, that through our software ecosystem, we can make a difference. Uh, but more importantly, at least for closed loop control, um, you have the possibility on the silicon on chip to run application specific code as we would like to call it. Well, what does that mean application specific code? That can mean a lot of things, um, but of course, uh, yeah, in the, in the discussion that we're having today, uh, it means this silicon on chip, it allows you to do closed loop control for example, based on the TV metric uh, that is coming back to the MCP uh, from the process. And so currently we have implemented PID control with a number of filters that you can put on and off. Uh, and another very nice feature is, that, you know, once you have implemented this type of controls, you can expose the settings and parameters to the user. So you can change them uh, during, well, during an experiment, it's maybe complicated, but between different experiments um, uh, without having to reprogram uh, your hardware. Uh, so that brings us then huh, to uh, the control loop where uh, the input is still your job file with you know, uh, vectors to be scanned with laser powers and laser speeds. But in between that input and the process, there is the control loop, which for the experiment that we will describe today is a P control loop, where the P control tries to bring the thermal energy density, the TED, to the nominal value that we want. And the control knob, yeah, so the, the knob that the control loop is turning, uh, is the laser power. And there is a median filter actually on the incoming uh, monitoring data. So briefly about the experiment that we did. Um, so I've talked about it a lot now. So the TED correlates really well to energy density. So a really nice experiment to do is to locally, and we can do this because we have control of the job file and the, the vectors inside, you locally reduce or increase, but we chose reduce the energy density by um, changing the energy density in a subset of uh, scanned vectors, if you want. And what we've done for our experiment is that we've created a conical or a pyramidical shape, if you want, where we go from um, inducing the error in all the vectors in the layer down to 50 vectors to 20 vectors, all the way to one. And so we're changing the size of the error in space while we move through the building of this uh, sample. And we've done it with uh, two reductions in power, which are quite large compared to the nominal laser power. So if you look uh, at the experiment without closed loop control, so we call that our reference experiment where we run this job file, but we don't yet enable our closed loop control, right? That's very important. Then in the center of this graph, you can see the sigma labs data where you can clearly see that in the center, the energy density is much lower compared to the borders of this scanned layer 
And of course, you know, every one of these sigma loss plots is one slice through your, um, yeah, your real sample. And the real sample in this slide is represented by this um, screenshot of, um, of the CT scan that we did. Uh, and in this CT scan, you can really nicely see that we've actually introduced these two conical or pyramidical uh, error shapes. Um, and uh, so, so you can see that, of course, uh, if you don't apply closed loop control, you're locally and in a controlled way inducing factors with a much reduced energy density. And so you're creating like a fusion force. And so you can see that those zones actually get created. And you can even see that there is a difference between the two zones, right? So in the bottom, the energy density um, reduction was larger than at the top. Uh, so that's obviously what we would expect, right? So let's turn on the closed loop control. Um, so again, we're doing a P control with a median filter on the incoming data but we are calculating the energy density values, the TED values on our MCP so that we can control uh, on those. And so on the left, you see two slices of the reference experiment, which I just showed you the CT scan and the data. Uh, on the right, you see the sigma lapse data from exactly the same experiment, but with closed loop control uh, enabled. And so what you can see or what this data at least su suggests is that for the majority of the vectors, the uh, errors are controlled out. Uh, what you can also see if you look really closely is that at the starts of the vectors, you can still um, slightly see the lowered energy density. Uh, and this relates to this uh, median filter that we have in between and which makes that it takes some time for our control algorithm uh, to respond to the to the change in the measured uh, TE. Uh, we have obviously also taken a CT scan of the sample with control. Uh, and this proves luckily that the data is right. And that where you have in the reference experiment these nice pyramidical shapes with uh, induced errors in the control experiments, those errors have disappeared. Uh, and everything looks pretty much uh, uniform, uh, which is exactly what we want, of course. Um, we've looked a little bit closer um, and uh, did um, a porosity analysis uh, using the, uh, the CP software. Now, please don't look at the absolute numbers of these porosity values. Uh, because we didn't calibrate the, the pore counting uh, routine in the CP software. So in absolute numbers, they are meaningless. But since we are using the same algorithm everywhere, relatively, we can, of course, uh, compare these numbers. Uh, and so, you know, lower is better, right? And so if you look at region one, where on the left, you have the reference experiment with obviously all the errors inside, you can see that if you look at the same zone in the uh, control experiment, in the experiment with closed loop control, that really the porosity is dramatically increased, uh, decreased, right? So it's improved. We're taking out uh, all of the pores. Uh, if you look at another zone, for example, this zone on top, which we call region of interest two, um, which is a zone in principle without induced errors, huh? so running at nominal values then you see that the porosity is slightly increased. Uh, come back to that later. Um, so uh, some remarks uh, which lead uh, to, that, um, to that remark about uh, the, the increased porosity in the nominal zone. So um, I already mentioned that the onsets of the vectors uh, seem like they are not correctly controlled out yet. Uh, and I think in these plots, uh, in these 2D plots, which is actually uh, a plot of the energy density as it is calculated on the MCP, uh, you can see, I think, even a bit better that those onsets of the vectors, right, the starts of the vectors, are still scanned 
uh, with a lower energy density. Right? So it takes our control loop a bit of time uh, to drive the, the laser power up, to drive the energy density back to the nominal value. Um, so that is a consequence of that uh, median filter that we have on the incoming raw data. Besides that, what you can see is that um, the, the control loop drives the, the energy density to the nominal value in, in a very straight line. Uh, you can see that best in the, in the raw data, uh, meaning uh, we've made the control loop quite aggressive, I would say, uh, to control out these defects that we artificially induced. And as a consequence of that, I think, and that's what happens in the nominal regions, um, the, the control loop is a bit too aggressive for the nominal regions. So in the nominal regions, you can see it best if you compare the nominal regions in the reference experiment to the nominal regions in the control experiment. You can see that in the control experiment, uh, they become a bit more noisy, right? So in other words, our control is actually making the energy density a little bit less stable, I would say. And so again, this is a consequence of how we uh, chose uh, our control parameters. Uh, and I think uh, the main thing to remember here, of course, is uh, this experiment is very artificial, right? So we're inducing in a stepwise manner uh, local regions with a reduced energy density, which is very nice again uh, for, for showing the power of closed loop control that, by the way, you get out of the box uh, with this combined materialized and sigma lab system. Um, so, so you can really show the power, but you, you can't really expect that for the nominal conditions, uh, the same uh, control parameters would work well. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, you know, is, is this a real scenario, right? And are these the control parameters that we should choose? Uh, we did a bit of a further study uh, because we've been talking about energy density, right? And thermal uh, TED being a good metric for energy density. But so far, we only induced errors by changing the laser power. And then we control them out by changing the laser power. So we did an experiment by inducing defects by changing the laser speed, right? Which also changes your input energy density. Um, but the control, right? The, the, the control loop still acts on the laser power. Um, so the control loop actually is, is completely identical huh, to the control loop that, that we showed in the previous experiment. And so, yeah, the strong points about this are, first of all, um, the control loop still works, right, without any adaptation. So also for uh, speed changes that induce an energy density change in your sample, the control loop manages to uh, control out those errors or those changes if you want. Uh, and yeah, the main proof that yeah, we're really working on energy density and that TED is a good representation of energy density is in the fact that you can see the length of these onsets of the vectors, right? Where our control loop needs time to control out the error, that this changes with changing speed. So the top two graphs are at a higher induced speed change than the bottom two graphs. And you can see that those onsets get longer in space, right? So in, in time, of course, they span exactly the same time. But since our, our laser is now traveling faster, uh, yeah, they span across a larger um, part of the space. Um, a bit more interesting is that um, we are now inducing an error by changing the laser speed, the scanning speed, uh, but we're controlling it out by changing the laser power. 
Uh, and this is where it gets really interesting because uh, when we were doing that for power, we would naturally get back to the original input parameters if you want. Huh? And so move back to what I would call the same place in parameter space. Uh, of course, if you do this for speed, um, you know, in the job file, uh, in the input file, we're saying increase the speed, right? Which is decreasing the energy density. Uh, and what our control loop will do is, is boost up the laser power to get to the same energy density. Uh, but yes, this, so this puts you in a, in a different space in a process parameter space. Uh, and one discussion point is, of course, uh, whether this is what you would want uh, or not. So that brings me to the conclusions already. Um, so the most important thing uh, with a very simple control loop, which again, you get it out of the box uh, in this combined uh, MCP signal up system. Um, we can control out the um, induced errors uh, in our system, and we can do this quite well. Um, now, like I said, and um, for the experiment that we've done, we controlled on laser power. So if you then induce an error with laser speed, you move your experiment to a different place in parameter space. To deal with this, uh, what we would want to work on in the future is to control also on speed um, or rather on speed. Uh, that's a discussion and some experiments to be done before we make that uh, decision. Uh, yeah, another a bit critical remark, self-critical remark. Um, the scenario that we have here, again, it's very nice for showing the potential of closed loop control and for making a, a nice uh, proof of concept experiment. Um, but of course, it's not uh, the most realistic example, probably, of what would happen in your everyday production. So uh, mainly the process control parameters would have to be tuned differently if you want to see an effect on you know parts being produced in your everyday uh, production. Uh, two more items to work on in the future, together with Sigma Labs or together with other people who would be interesting to work uh, with us on this in the future, would be uh, you know we can make use of a lot more. I would say of all the data that we anyway have available in the MCP to make the control loop better and smarter. One simple example, but I can think of many more, would be to use the vector type, because um, I guess many people will agree that you don't want every vector to have the same energy density from the input already. So you would want to be able to control different vector types uh, to different values. Uh, the last one is about using history. Um, that means um, we are now showing an experiment where uh, all these onsets of the vectors are not yet controlled out. Uh, and we felt that that's the most uh, honest thing to do. Uh, what I mean here by using history would be uh, we could fill this buffer of, the, um, uh, of our filter and also the settings to the laser power at the start of a vector with the data from the previous vector, which is naturally, it doesn't happen because there's always a jump between vectors, uh, but that would be a solution uh, to not having those onsets. Uh, and then I could have potentially shown you an experiment which would only have the very first onset. Um, I think in reality, whether you would want to use history or not, uh, it depends very much on which type of errors that you would expect for your material, for your machine, and for the experiments that you are doing. And with that, I would like to conclude and hand the word back to Jacob, I think, for the general conclusions and the Q&A. Thank you very much, Sven. I uh, appreciate you walking through that. Looks like we've got some good uh, questions uh, flowing in here. So I think we can have a good, uh, good Q&A session here. We got about just under 10 minutes left. Um, but just to kind of close and circle it back, um, uh, 
you know, MCP being an open machine control solution really enables um, a lot of development for, you know, own printing and controlling strategies, tailoring the process of, you know, to applications and then uh, monitoring control uh, in the MCP environment as well as linkage to uh, things and, and data like ourselves. So the Sigma Labs MCP combination um, really can focus on process development and MPI uh, reduction, um, the live monitoring and QC for manufacturing inspection. And then uh, obviously today what we talked about, which is uh, taking that data and actually doing something with it in real time, um, which I think there was a, uh, a great walkthrough there of, of a couple ways where that was uh, implemented and, and uh, showed a path to kind of future growth. And I think I'll comment, Sven, similarly to yourself, I, I think this is an incredible demonstration of uh, what can be done here. And I think it's, it's opened the door for uh, a lot of growth. This is kind of the beginning. And so as we go back to, you know, kind of what Darren closed with in his session, we've kind of, we've hit the proof of concept today. Uh, we've got some good foundational data and then there's a lot more the additive community I think can do uh, as a whole together to really drive um, OEE. So <clears throat> just bring it back to this picture, maybe can kind of help as we answer some questions as well. Um, but, you know, today we've done the, the energy density <clears throat> and that can move into a number of different areas as we go forward. We have, um, you know, other, other areas that are being monitored, history, data lake, like you talked about, uh, Sven, but um, your machine health data, your additional melt pool data, your camera imagery data, um, there's a lot of things that can contribute, you know, really powerful ways to go from just reaction to potentially future healing mechanisms. So you see a trend and you correct the trend uh, as a whole. So um, I will maybe open it. Uh, any closing comments, Sven or Darren, you wanted to add quickly before we go into questions uh, at all, or I can jump right in. I have one. I I, th I think the uh, I think the industry uh, should be very excited about what uh, Materialize has done here. Um, also, you'll notice that um, as Sven highlighted the onsets, um, you know that the future is um, is nonlinear um, in terms of uh, vector sets as it relates to you know compensating for specific energy densities, and um, uh, that's something that uh, I know Materialize has, um, and. Um, you know, so so you know the you know so so the future is going to have to encompass, you know, variable energy density within vectors at, at you know with where one can input specific functions, and that that's going to create a lot of exciting research, I think, internationally. Um, so um, I think that's a just a really quick um, item to add. I think that's beneficial for what Materialize has created. Great. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm reading through questions here. I think I really appreciate that, that uh, addition, Darren. I think we have a really interesting um, one uh, next here. So uh, it looks like um, you mentioned temperature early above. How do you envision this playing into closed loop uh, manufacturing or materials uh, development? It looks like there's a continuation too. Maybe I'll stop there and we'll finish that question afterwards. But so I guess, uh, maybe this is to you, Darren, um, on the temperature discussion you had. How do you uh, see that potentially playing a closed loop in the future? Right. So if, if you look at step one here in terms of the proof of concept, obviously step one uh, needs to mature, right, as we, uh, we would you know, incrementally evolve it. Um, I've always had a vision. I, I think I shared this with Sven also a few years ago that, you know, we would, um, you, if you can imagine you're, 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 you know, you're, you're scanning a layer um, or you've, you've put down a layer and then you get the monitoring data, both maybe the energy density and the temperature data. And then together you could go, so if you could then um, classify the, you know, the anomaly or the flaw and make a, a deterministic a decision as to whether or not you want to go and, uh, if you will, conscript a certain uh, strategy. For example, maybe you decided that you wanted to do a spiral um, for, at a particular um, energy um, for, for example, um, given a specific vector set, I, I call them healing, uh, 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 you know, because uh, that, that's probably something for easy to understand where you, you come back afterwards and, and then you begin to maybe uh, do touch ups. But it's not, I don't think it's going to have, 
I think what has to be developed is the uh, the evaluation, the classification, the identification as, as we're, you know, we're beginning to do that. Um, and then making sure that you properly um, update, you know, create these scan, uh, scan strategies of the future to, to bring about these, as I call, healing strategies. So that's, that's where it goes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from my background in the, the material side a little bit too, I'm super excited about, you talk about, you know, monitoring, we're looking at energy density now, you know, the materials teams are going to be very concerned, am I keeping the same grain structure throughout my part, as an example, and so the ability to provide closed loop, but also ensure that you maybe stay within that grain structure via cooling rates and temperature, I, I think is really exciting, so that's, that's great. Um, maybe spend this one uh, for you. So there was a slide at the introduction. Uh, I know that you showed on uh, the parameter variance. So maybe this is where this comes from, but um, do you think the, the connectivity of monitoring and uh, MCP can have a large impact on process parameter development? So this is maybe not as closed loop focused, but maybe the front end of it, which has to do with like NPI reduction. Um, yeah, absolutely, that. absolutely. It's a it's a very good question actually, and uh, I I know it can right. So uh, I think Darren will remember uh, when was it the last form next where Darren presented for Sigma Labs. Um, he presented uh, some of the nice work that we had been doing together. Uh, but um, we also um, used the, the Sigma Labs feedback and the Sigma Labs monitoring data in the context of, for example, our process tuner application, right? So uh, process tuning is a, is a relatively new application at Materialize where we want to help people uh, shorten uh, this, this um, yeah, search or this quest uh, for new process parameters, if you want. Uh, and you can actually choose your own metric, right? So, uh, you know, a quality monitoring metric could be a good metric also uh, to, to use to, to develop your process metric, as could be, you know, a density measurement or, or a mechanical property measurement. So yes, definitely, you know, if you have high quality monitoring systems with metrics that you trust, you can definitely use them uh, for that purpose as well. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, one here, so you mentioned a couple of things uh, uh, throughout Sven, uh, this, this person was wondering, what was the most surprising thing that was learned um, from the group? Maybe uh, I'll start with Sven or Darren. What, what, as we implemented uh, closed loop together, were there any surprises uh, that you, you saw or kind of things that um, popped up that were interesting learnings? You want to go first, Aaron, or I can go first? I, I think was, to uh, us. Uh, well, I, I think there was definite excitement um, about uh, what we accomplished. Uh, if you if you look at the CT data and you can see the you know the pyramid of uh, you know and then and then you um, you can see it uh, disappear, if you will, right? Uh, the porosity pyramid, um, and then to be able to see the cars. There's actually one slide that, there where uh, he shows a cross section, if you will. Of, and he correlates the CT to the in-process data. Um, that's really fantastic for me. I was, in a way, blown away by that. To be honest with you, um, so um, I think in this is a. I'm just excited about the fact that we have a really great foundation, you know, to start with, and uh, and, and we can, you know, we can build forward. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say. I mean, at the risk of sounding a bit tacky, of course, but. Um, the, the, the real surprise to us and the people of the MCP team that were involved in, in setting up this experiment, they, they will agree, I think. Uh, so the, the real surprise to us was how little tuning in parameters we needed to do uh, to get to the result that, that we've shown today. And I think this has to do with two things, right? One thing is you know, the quality of the metric uh, that we send into, into the MCP. And the other is, of course, all the work that we had already done together with Sigma Labs, right? So understanding the system, the combined system, uh, and how the metrics work and what it can and cannot do. So, yeah. Perfect. So I think we have, let's do one more question and then uh, we'll wrap it up. I just, again, want to say thank you to everybody uh, who joined us today. 
Uh, we do have some additional questions. I know about six or seven more that uh, we likely will follow up with email after the one that I asked here um, as well. So the, the last, uh, last one and then a closing message. So you showed a slide depicting correlation between thermal sensing data and CT data. Have you developed statistically based confidence levels um, for the degree of correlation you can share across the entire build? So I think um, this is uh, near and dear to the heart of us and the quality side of things is, you know, how do you judge yourself from a validation perspective? So I know, uh, Darren, this is a big part of our validation going forward, um, you know, judging ourselves on percent correlation to both auto, you know, generated and stochastically generated uh, anomalies. Any commentary you want to give here, maybe yes, on the yes. broader work? Yeah, I can talk. I can talk a little bit more about about that process. So, um, so for right now, obviously, the process of doing that is to is, you got to we, we take this, the digital CT data and we do, we do an we do a registration to an in process data metric. That's the first step, and you train and it gets trained essentially based on well, we're starting with lack of fusion, right? Because that's that's one of the industry clear, clear focuses. So by doing that, then using a machine learning metric, we can generate a, a prediction metric. And, and using the prediction metric, we can begin to use uh, uh, ML models. And one of, one of those parameters is called the Matthews correlation coefficient. And in the Matthews correlation coefficient, you can get um, the efficacy relating to that correlation, right? So that's just one model, but there are other models, right? You know, that we're, we're, we're actively in, in mining. Um, so that's that is the um, that's the particular approach that has to be used. And why does it have to be used? It's because there's so much there's so much data, um, and um, you know it's, there's a lot of digital data. And even uh, in an in process you know volume, um, you have a lot of data. So that that's the so that's the particular uh, process you use, um, and uh, that will bring you uh, an advanced statistical, uh, if you will. Um, yeah approach and i won't say it's perfect but it's it's well, uh, it, it's it's a process that will really um uh you know get you uh, get you very close yeah and it gives actionable data i think and the judgment then comes from correlation and, and growing and getting better and i, I think yeah. you know, as you approach the greater than 90 percent correlation you really start to see the impact of machine learning and ai so any any follow-up we would welcome there we certainly can get into the weeds of machine learning and ai uh with the teams i think there's some other questions here that we'll try to to answer uh, with that. So just last thing um, uh, for the group here. So uh, for somebody that wants to interact or join, um, you know, this closed loop path, what's the next best step? And I can maybe take a stab and you guys can add at it, but um, we're working this together. So uh, reaching out directly to materialize uh, MCP team or Sigma Labs um, from the monitoring side, we can connect the dots. We work very closely together there. So please don't hesitate. Contact information uh, actually is here on this last page, and I will make sure uh, we send that in the follow-up email uh, as well um, here. So I really want to thank everyone again for that. Um, we are, you know, I think both sides, I don't want to speak for a spend, you can comment, but, um, you know, whether it's directly with MCP working strategies on, you know, your processing or, you know, Sigma Labs on the quality side. Certainly if parties want to join and, and look at development in the future collaboratively, I think we're, we're welcoming people working direct in their own buildings or if they, you know, have some things they want to tackle together. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to bring this forward for the industry and would welcome reaching out uh, to either party to do so. All right. Well, thank you all for the time. I uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, we'll be following up with an email to, to cover the rest of the questions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Me too. Thank you.